Uh, I've read the book so many times. I, I, I'm sure I didn't notice this earlier when I read it, but notice what time they leave. They're in the heart of darkness. They're in the darkest part of the whole story in, in some respect. They leave at noon, which is the brightest or part of the day. So they, I just think that's interesting, that contrast. Uh, would you mind? When they carry Kurtz into the pilot house, there was more air there. Winding about two staircases over the shutter, there was an eddy in the mass of human bodies, and a woman who had come with helmets and head and tawny cheeks rushed out to the very brink of the stream. She put on her hands, shouted something, and all the wild mob took up the shell in the roaring chorus of articulated, rapid, breathless utterance. Do you understand this? And that's, that's his uh, intended, his girlfriend, his African girlfriend. Uh, yeah, come on, sit, sit, sit. The casual looking out passed with fire long eyes, with the mingled expression of wistful and pain. He made no answer, but I saw a smile, a smile of indefinable meaning, meaning appear on his colorless lips. That moment, after twitching convulsively, do I not, he said slowly, gasping. I, I pulled the string of the whistle, and I did it because I saw the pilgrim on the deck giving out their rifles with the air and interested in jolly work. At the sudden screech, there was a moment of movement of a dead pair through the wedge mass of bodies. Don't, don't be frightened or alive, cried someone on deck. This, this So these people were mourning the loss of Kurtz, and here are these pilgrims on board. There's just four or five of them, the Europeans, shooting indiscriminately into the wilderness, just trying to have some fun. You know, let's kill, let's kill some of them. Um, but Marlowe, notice what he does. He he pulls the horn or the whistle, steam whistle, not to uh, prevent the people from attacking him, but to prevent the pilgrims from attacking the people. Uh, literally, he was trying to protect the. Uh, the, the natives and tried to scatter them so they wouldn't get killed, which is a civilized thing to do. The brown current ran swiftly out of the heart of darkness, bearing us down towards the sea with twice the speed of our upwards progress. And Kurt's life was running swiftly too, ebbing, ebbing out of his heart into the sea in an unrexable time. The manager was very placid. He had no vital anxieties. Now, he took us both in with a comprehensive and satisfied glance. The affair had come off as well as could be wished. I saw the time approaching when I would be left alone of the party of unsound method. The pilgrims had become me with this favor. I was, so to speak, numbered with the dead. It is strange how I dreaded this unforeseen partnership. This choice of nightmares forced me in the pen to numerous lands invaded by these mean. So he's realizing that once he gets home, his usefulness to these people is over. Um, what are they going to do to him? I'm talking about the Europeans. He's not worried about the natives. He's worried about, um, you know, what's he going to do? And his sympathy is for Kurtz. As bad as he is, he's better than these guys. He doesn't like these guys. These guys, and Kurtz too, but they both represent imperialism. And Kurtz represents the red-eyed devil, the aggressive devil, these guys represent the flabby or lazy devil. You know, it's kind of like what they don't do. They don't care. They they don't aim. They just shoot. You know, that kind of thing. They're both dangerous. Uh, and then you want to read a little bit. Mm -hmm. What page are you on? Uh, 137. Remember, it's Curse's voice that is so mesmerizing. It's hypnotic. The uh, brown? Yeah. The 
Mr. Brown Kurt I'm sorry, Kurt's discourse. Right. Kurt's discourse, the voice, the voice that rang deep to the very last. Mr. Fred is trained to hide <laughs> in the magnificent folds of eloquence. The barren darkness of his heart. Oh, he struggled, he struggled. Let me finish it for you. Okay. Nah, I do, I do. The waste of his weary brain were haunted by shadowy images. No. Images of. I right, do it. Images of wealth and fame resolving obsequiously around his extinguished, unextinguishable gift of noble and lofty expression. My intended, my station, my career, my ideas. These were the subjects for the occasional utterance of elevated sentiments. The shade of the original Kurtz frequented the bedside of this hollow sham, whose fate was to be buried presently in the mold of primeval earth. Uh, but both the diabolic love and the unearthly hate uh, of the mysteries it had penetrated fought for the possession of that soul, satiated with primitive emotions, avid of lying fame, of sham distinction, and of all the appearances of success and power. Uh, Lillian. Sometimes he is intensely, intensely childish. He desired to have kings meet him at railway, railway stations on his return from his ghastly nowhere, where he intended to accomplish great things. You show them you have in you something that is really profitable, and then there will be no limits to recognition of your ability. He would say, of course, you must take care of the motives, right motives, always, the long reaches that were like one of the same reach, mon no, monotonous mm -hmm. bends that were exactly alike, slipped past the stream which, with their multitude of secular trees looking patiently after the grimy fragment of another world. The forerunner of change, of conquest, of trade, of massacre, of blessing. I looked ahead, piloting, closed the shutters, said Kurtz, suddenly one day. I can't bear to look at this. I did so. There was silence. Oh, but I was, but I will wring your heart yet, he cried at the invisible wilderness. He broke down as I had expected and had to lie up through a carriage at the head of the, at the, head of the island. His delay was the first thing that shook Kurt's confidence. One morning he gave me a packet of papers and a photograph, a lot tied to, together with a shoestring. Keep it for me, he said. This is not to fool, this not to fool, meaning the manager. afternoon I saw him. He was lying on his back with closed eyes and I withdrew quietly, but I heard him mutter that if rightly die, die, I was with him. There was nothing more. Was he rehearsing some speech in his talent? Or was it a fragment of phrase from some newspaper article? He had been writing for these papers and meant to do so again for the furthering of my ideas, if the reason. This was an impenetrable darkness. I looked at him and he threw down at a man who was lying at the bottom of a precipice where the sun never shines. But I had not much time to give him because I was helping the engine driver take the pieces to the leaky cylinder. Straight to the engine engine house and in other such matters. I lived in an infernal mess of rust, filings, nuts, bolts, spanners, hammers, ratchet drills, things I abominate because I don't get on the car. I sent it with a little boy who fortunately had a boy. I toiled wearily in a wretched, yeah, in a wretched scrap heap. Unless I had the shape too bad to stand. the next sentence. The horror, the horror. Okay, circle it, underline it. That's, those are Kurtz's last words. 
people's last words are significant. Uh, great people, particularly, not saying he's great, but he's really important in the book. And his last words are the words, uh, the horror of the horror we could see. Um, Tucker. Underline that. We're going to see that again in a poem I'm going to give you. It's, that's actually part of the poem. That's not it. All the pilgrims rushed out to see. I remained and went on with my day. I believe I was considered three weeks in the shadows. However, I did not eat much. There was a lamp that light on the front mirror, and outside it was so deeply, deeply dark. So he, I guess that's the answer. It's complicated. But why is he so loyal to Kurtz? Why is Marlowe so loyal? Because he uh, he told the truth, the horror. That's the truth. Life, as they see it, is is that you can sum it up in two words: the horror. And he uh, he he saw it. That's when before he died, he, he lived there. So even though it's not, I mean, 
that's not true. We don't think that's true. We know that's not true. There are horrible things about lies, but that's not the whole truth. And so, but anyway, that explains why he's loyal to Kurt, because in his opinion, Kurt's told the truth. Um, I'll keep reading. Uh, by the way, Marlo gets sick. So there's a, it's kind of confusing here. All of a sudden, you'll see him back in Brussels. So I'll get us there. I only have eight more pages. No, they did not bury me, though there is a period of time which I remember mistily with a shaking wonder like, with a shuddering wonder like a passage through some inconceivable world that had no hope in it and no desire. I found myself back in the sepulchral city, so he's back in Belgium, um, represent or resenting the sight of people hurrying through the streets to filch a little money from each other, to devour their infamous cookery, to gulp their unwholesome deer, to dream their insignificant and silly dreams. They, trans they trespassed upon my thoughts. They were intruders whose knowledge of life was to me an irritating pretext because I felt so sure they could not possibly know the things I knew. Their bearing, which was simply the bearing of commonplace individuals going about their business in the uh, assurance of perfect safety was offensive to me, like the outrageous flauntings of folly in the face of danger uh, it had it was unable to comprehend. So if you're in the question, we did 26. We'll have to go back to 25. We did 26. Uh, 27, what does Marlowe learn about Kurtz when he returns to Europe? We haven't gotten there yet, so we got to go back. 28, we can answer. How does Marlowe feel about the people he passes in the sepulchral city? Any answers? We just read it. I just read it. Um, he, he was appalled at their ignorance because now he knew something they didn't know. They were just very comfortable in their day-to-day -day lives, going to work, basically what everybody always does, go to work, have a family, whatever. But they were ignorant of the truth that he learned from Kurt is that life is horrible. Um, that's the truth, and it's pretty, pretty, um, pretty negative. Um, but, but that's how he feels himself superior and separated from these people. They don't know what I know. Um, I had no particular desire to enlighten them, but I had some difficulty in restraining myself from laughing in their faces, so full of stupid importance. I dare say I was not well at the time. I tottered about the street. There were various affairs to settle, grinning bitterly at perfectly respectable persons. I admit my behavior was inexcusable, but then my temperature was seldom normal in those days. My dear aunt's endeavors to nurse up my strength seemed altogether beside the mark. It was not my strength that wanted nursing. It was my imagination that wanted soothing. I kept the bundle of papers given me by Kurtz, not knowing exactly what to do with it. His mother had died lately, watched over, as I was told, by his intended. Now, he has a European girlfriend, and the story's going to end there in just a few pages. That, that's his other intended a clean-shaven man. Now, three people come to visit him. Uh, I don't think I'd ask you that question, but I'm going to ask you to know it. Three people come and visit him. All right, here's the first one. An official. He's number one. Probably with the company that he was with. Uh, with an official manner uh, and wearing gold-rimmed spectacles, called on one day and made inquiries at the first circuitous, afterwards suavely pressing about what he had pleased to dominate, to denominate certain documents. I was not surprised because I had had two rows with the manager on the subject out there. I had refused to give up the smallest scrap of that package, and I took the same attitude with the speckled man. He came dark, menacing at last, and with much heat argued that the company had the right to every bit of information about his territory. And he said, Mr. Kurtz's knowledge of exploring regions, of unexplored regions, must have been necessarily extensive and peculiar, owing to his great ability and to the deplorable circumstances in which he had been placed. Therefore, I assured Mr. Kurtz's not, I assured him of Mr. Kurtz's knowledge, however extensive, did not bear upon the problem of commerce administration. He invoked that then the, the, the name of Simon. It would be an incalculable loss, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I offered him the report on the suppression of the savage customs with the postscriptum torn off. He took it up eagerly. 
but ended up sniffing at it with an air of contempt. This is not what we had a right to expect, he remarked. Nothing else, except nothing else, I've said. There are only private letters. He, he withdrew upon some threat of legal proceedings, and I saw him no more. So that's the first visitor, I said, an official from the company. Second visitor is a cousin of Kurtz. Uh, Kurtz's cousin appeared two days later and was anxious um, to hear all the details about his dear relative's last moment. Incidentally, he gave me to understand that Kurtz had been essentially a great musician, that there was a making of an immense success, said the man, who was, also, who was an organist, I believe. The lank gray hair flowing over the greasy collar coat. I had no reason to doubt his statement. And to this day, I am unable to say what Kurtz's profession, whether he had ever had any, which was the greatest of his talents. I had taken him for a painter who wrote for the newspapers or else for a journalist who could paint. But even the cousin who took snuff during the interview could not tell me what he had been exactly. He was a universal genius. So the cousin comes and, and Marlowe finds out that he was a great musician. We already know he was a writer. He was a speaker. He, had, he was a great leader. People followed him. Um, he was a painter. He was a, uh, going back to 143, he was a universal genius. On that point, I agree with the old chap, who therefore, upon, uh, blew his nose noisily into a large cotton handkerchief and drew in senile agitation, bearing off some family letters and mem mem memoranda without importance. Ultimately, and this is the third guy, and, and a journalist, or an official, a cousin, and a journalist, anxious to know something of the fate of his dear colleague turned up. This big visitor informed me Kurt's proper sphere also had been politics on the popular side. He had furry, straight eyebrows, bristly, bristly hair cropped short, an eyeglass on a broad, broad ribbon, and becoming expansive, confessed his opinion that Kurtz could really write a bit, couldn't, couldn't write a bit. But heavens, how that man could talk. He electrified large meetings. He had faith, don't you see? He had the faith. He could see himself to believe anything, anything. He could have been a splendid leader of an extreme party. What party, I asked? Any party, answered the other. He was an, an extremist. Did I not think so? I assented. Then I know he asked with a sudden flash of curiosity what it was that had induced him to go out there. Yes, said I, forthwith handed him the famous report for publication, if he thought fit. He glanced through it hurriedly, mumbling all the time, judged it would do, and took himself off to this plunder. Thus I was left at last with a slim packet of letters and the girl's portrait. She struck me as beautifully. Uh, he's talking about the girlfriend, not the African girlfriend, the European. I mean, she has a beautiful expression. I know that the sunlight can be mean, can be made to lie too. Yet one felt that no manipulation of light and pose could have conveyed the delicate shade of truthfulness upon those features. She seemed ready to listen without mental reservation, without suspicion, without a thought for herself. I concluded. I would go on and give her back the portrait and those letters myself. Curiosity? Yes. And also some other feeling, perhaps. All that had been cursed had passed out of my hands. His soul, his body, his station, his plans, his ivory, his career. There remained only his memory and his intention. And I wanted to give that up, too, to the past, in a way, to surrender personally all that remained of him and me to that oblivion which is the last word of our common faith. I don't defend myself. I had no clear perception of what it, what it was I really wanted. Perhaps it was an impulse of conscious loyalty, of the fulfillment of one of those ironic necessities that lurk in the facts of human existence. I don't know, I can't tell, but I went. So he goes to see her, and Jeff, could you pick it up here? He, he goes to see her um, to give her what's left of Kurtz's things, his letters and personal letters and things, and we'll see what happens. I thought his memory, on page 144. I thought his memory was like the other memories of the dead that accumulate in every man's life. A vague, a vague impress on the brain of shadows that 
all anointed in their swift and final passes, but before the high and ponderous sword, between the tall houses of the street, still as street as still in the chorus is a well kept alley in the cemetery. I had a vision of him on the stretcher, opening his mouth voraciously, as if to devour all the earth with all his mankind. He lived in before me, he lived as much as he had ever lived. A shadow insatiable of splendid appearances, of frightful realities, a shadow darker than the shadow of the night great nobly in the folds of the gorgeous elegance. The vision seemed to enter the house, the stretcher of tank bearers and the wild crowd of obedient worshippers. The gloom of the forest, the glitter of the reeds between the murky bends, the beat of the drum, regular and muffled like the beating of a heart, the heart of a conquering foe. It was a moment of triumph for the wilderness, an invading, invincible rush, which it seemed to me I would I would have to keep back alone for the salvation of man. In the memory of what I had heard him say of Arthur, with the horn shaped stirring at my back, and the glow of fire, the goodness patient was, those broken phrases came back to me, were heard again in their ominous and terrifying simplicity. I remembered his abject pleading, his abject threats, the colossal scale of his vile desire, the meanness, the torment, the tempestuous anguish of his soul. And later on, I seemed to see his collected, languid hands. He said one day, this log of ivory now is really mine. The company could not pay for it. I collected it myself at a very great personal risk. I'm afraid they will try to claim it as theirs, though. Hmm, it is a difficult case. What do you think I ought to do? Resist, eh? I want no more than justice. He wanted no more than justice, no more than justice. I rang the bell before a mahogany door on the first floor. While I waited, he seemed to stare at me out of the glassy panel. There was that wide and immense stare, embracing, condemning, loathing all the universe. I seemed to hear the whispered cry, the horror, the horror. Thank you, Harvey. The dust was falling. I had not heard the sound of the wind.
was painfully mingled with her cry of despair and regret. The summoned up whisper of his eternal condemnation. I asked myself what was I, what I was doing with the sensation of panic in my heart, as though I had blundered into a place of cruel and absurd mysterious, not fit for a human being to behold. She motioned me to a chair. We sat down. I lit the pack of gently on the table taken, and she passed He's talking to you. He's talking to Kurtz's girlfriend. Intimacy grows quickly out there, I said. I knew him as well as it was possible for one man to know another. You admired him, he said. It was impossible to know him and not to admire him, was it? He was a remarkable man, I said unsteadily. And before the appealing fixity of her gaze that seemed to watch for more words on my lips, I went on. It was possible not to love him, she finished eagerly. Silencing me into an appalled dumbness. How true, how true, but when you think that no one knew him so well as I, I had all his noble confidence. I knew him best. You knew him best, I repeated, and perhaps you did, but with every word spoken, the room was getting was growing darker, and only her forehead, smooth and white, remained illumined by the extinguishable light of belief and love. You were his friend, she went on, his friend, she repeated a little louder. He must have been if he had given you this and sent you to me. I feel I can speak to you, and oh, I must speak. I want you, you who have heard his last words, to know I have been worthy of him. It is not pride. Yes, I am proud to know I understood him better than anyone on earth. He told me so himself. And since his mother died, I have told no, I have had no one, no one to, to. Uh, notice what she says. She says, uh, I want you, you who have heard his last words, to know I have been worthy of him. And notice that it's as the room is getting darker. So he, remember, when he met Kurtz, when he was crawling to the, the, the guy, um, that was like the, the heart of darkness. He even says the next day it was bright and he sailed away from the heart of darkness. Well, in this room with this girl, it's literally getting darker at night. It's cloudy outside. Well, you'll see what she asked him. It's, it's interesting how this works. You want to read this next one? I listened. The darkness depend, deepened. I was not even sure whether he had given me the right bundle. I rather suspect he wanted me to take care of another batch of his papers, which after his death I saw the manager examine, examining under the lamp and the girl talked, easing her pain and the scarcity of my sympathy. She talked as a thirsty man, as talked as thirsty men dream. I had heard that her engagement with Kurtz had been disproved by her people. He wasn't rich enough or something. And indeed, I don't know whether he had not been a pauper all his life. He had given me some reason to infer that it was his impatience of comparative poverty that drove him out of there. Thank you. Uh, it was not his friend who had heard him speak once, she, she was saying. He drew him towards him by what was best for she looked at me with intensity. It is a great, a gift of the great. She went on, and the second, and the sound of her voice, low voice seemed to have the accompaniment of all those other sounds, full of mystery, desolation, and sorrow I have ever heard. The ripple of the river, river the swelling of the trees swayed by the wind, the murmurs of the crowd, the faint ring of incomprehensible words cried from afar. Whisper of a voice speaking from behind, beyond the threshold of an eternal love. But you have heard him, you know, she cried. Yes, I know, I said with something like despair in my heart, but bowing my head for the faith I would answer before that great and saving illusion that shone with an unearthly glow in the darkness. And that triumphant distance from which I could not have defended him, from which I could not even protect myself. What a loss to me, to us, who corrected herself with beautiful curiosity. Then happy in the murmur of the world, by the lost gleams of twilight, I could see the glitter of her eyes full of tears, of tears that would not fall. I have not been very happy, very fortunate, very proud, she went on. She too fortunate, too happy for a little while, and now I am happy for her for life. She stood up, her fair hair seemed to catch all the remaining light in the glitter of gold. I would have too. And all of this... I just want to point out she's blonde. 
and just the bright, the light. Hey, um, okay, just pray for him to come back. So it, it, notice the contrast. Her, her bright hair versus the dark atmosphere. Remember the girlfriend in Africa? She was, she was uh, the African, and so she had dark hair. She can keep reading. And all of this, she went on mournfully of all his promise, of all his greatness, of his generous mind, of his noble heart, nothing remains, nothing but a memory, you and I. We shall always remember him like the day sweet man she cried. It is impossible that all of this should be lost, that such a life as should be sacrificed, leave nothing but sorrow. You know what vast plans he had. Um, I knew of them too. I could not perhaps understand, but others knew, others knew of them. Something must remain. Words were a man with her, and his example she was her joy soul. Men looked up to him, his goodness shone in every day. His example, true, I said, his example too. Yes, his example, I forgot that. But I do not, I cannot, I cannot believe, not yet. I cannot believe that I shall never see him again, that nobody will ever will see him again. Never, never, never. She put out her arms as if after a retreating figure, stretching them black and with black, black pale hands across the fading and narrow sheen of the window. Never see him. I saw him clearly enough then. I shall see this eloquent phantom as long as I live, and I shall see her too. A tragic and familiar shade, resembling in this gesture another one. Tragic also, and bedecked with the powerless charms, stretching bare brown on her the glitter of her infernal stream. The stream of darkness. She said suddenly very low, He died as he lived. His end, said I, with dull anger stirring in me, was in every way worthy of his life. And I was not with him, she murmured. My anger subsided before a feeling of infinite pity. Everything that could be done, I mumbled. Uh, but I believe in him more than anyone on earth, more than his own mother, more than himself. He needed me, me. I would have treasured every sigh, every word, every sign, every glance. I felt like a chill grip. I felt like a chill grip on my chest. Don't, don't, I said in a muffled voice. This is the last page of the book, all right? And so just, it ends with a really interesting little thing that happened. Um, so notice, uh, well, you'll uh, just watch and see. Okay, what were his last words? All right, she wants to know what the last words are. She's a, a good person. She's an innocent person. She's a beautiful, go ahead and sit down. Wait for him to sit down. He knows how to open the door. I, I mean, like, he can open the door. Just sit down. Okay, what's the last words? Uh, I'm going to read you what she says. She says, She asked, what did he say? What was his last word? And he's got to respond to it. Repeat. She murmured in a heartbreaking tone. I want, I want something, something. I was on the point of crying again. Don't you hear them? The dust was repeating in this persistent whisper all around me, and the whisper that seemed to swell up menacingly, like the first whisper of rising wind. The horror, the horror. His last words. They look at question number 33. Why does he lie to her? That's when those weren't his last words. So he lies to her. Why? Say, who said it? Say it again. The word broker. Did you say broke? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It would have broken her heart because she had this, this belief in him that he couldn't he couldn't tell her the truth. But he still told a lie. Earlier in the book he said he hates lies. Um, and yet he was willing to tell one. Why does he tell? What? Well, it's just interesting to me why he 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 does that. But you're right. I mean that's that's his motive right here. He doesn't want to break her heart. Um, and whoever's next can finish it.
heard a light sigh and then my heart stood still. I stopped dead short by an exulting and terrible cry. Uh, by, this, by the cry of an inconceivable triumph and unspeakable pain. I knew it. I was sure. She knew. She was sure. I heard her weeping. She had hidden her face in her hands. It seemed to me that proudly collapsed before I could escape. That the heavens would fall upon my head, but nothing happened. Heavens do not fall for such a trifle. Would, would they have fallen, I wonder, if I had rendered Kurtz that justice which, with which he was due? Hadn't, hadn't he said he only wanted justice? But I couldn't. I could not tell her. I would all, it would only have been too dark, too dark altogether. Okay. You can read the last paragraph. There ends his story. The story is over. And the last paragraph goes back. He's never left the ship, the one in the Thames with the five people on it. So the, the narrator finishes it. Kurtz is finished. Um, I think. Yeah, Kurtz is finished speaking, so you can read the last paragraph. Marlowe ceased and sat apart, indistinct and silent, with the pose of a meditating Buddha. Nobody moved for a time. We have lost the first of the ebb, said the director suddenly. I raised my head. The offing was barred by a black bank of clouds and drank the water away, leaving to the uttermost ends of the earth, both somber under an overcast sky. It seemed to lead into the heart of an immense darkness. All right. Well, uh, you know, I, it, I don't know what you think of it. I've read it. I don't know how many times I've read it. Um, it, it always interests me, so I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wish I could take credit for it. So look at the last sentence. The novel ends with the narrator saying that the Thames seemed to lead into the heart of an immense darkness. What does he mean? Ninth title of the book. Here it is in the last sentence. Darkness. And the room was dark. And he lies to her. Darkness. Yeah. But it's sad and it's sort of a, 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 a surrender to the darkness it's as if the darkness wins and it will always win if there's not something or someone to and of course we know who that hero is the author doesn't mention any solution just the triumph of evil it just suggests the triumph of evil anybody have all these finished I noticed a lot of you were writing you should you could so I need to I need to see him at some point if you can bring him up here in a minute. That would be great.